Welcome to the Compliance 911 Show, a no-nonsense podcast discussing hot topics for today's busy compliance professional. It's everything you wanted to know about regulatory compliance, but we're afraid to ask. And now, here are your hosts, Dean Stockford of m M&M Consulting and Len Suzio of Geodata Vision. Welcome to our podcast series addressing everything you wanted to know about regulatory compliance, but we're afraid to ask. This is Len Suzio with Joe Data Vision. I'm joined today by Dean Stockford of m M&M Consulting. Dean, it seems like a decade ago, but it was only back in 2021, you warned our audience of an emerging hot topic with assessing climate-related risk. Lately, I have been hearing more and more about this issue. I was wondering if you could enlighten us. Len, as you know, we've had many discussions about climate-related risk over the last several years, specifically you and I, (laughs) (laughs) although although we we haven't seen, you know, regulation, the examiner's expectations continue to be evolving. And especially, you know, I hate to call them out, but especially for those financial institutions that are located in New York, we've definitely seen some, some enforcement relative to climate risk in those markets. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned New York, because as we've heard from several financial institutions in that market regarding climate-related risk, so it's definitely a hot topic in New York State. Yeah, well, I would agree. And and actually, it kind of dates back to last year, December of 23, New York State, which has been the lead, kind of, I'll I'll just say the the leading publisher of climate-related risk guidance for financial institutions, published a a, a must-read section on their website uh, dedicated to educating financial institutions on the risks that are associated with climate change. Now, we're not here to debate or talk about uh, climate change. We're here to talk about climate risk, but the guidance for New York State regulated institutions is intended, was, and is intended to help manage financial and operational risk from a climate change perspective. In fact, they also held a webinar back in January of this year which is really setting the table for climate risk regulation as we know. Yes, I actually listened to that webinar. The New York State Bankers Association was active in that. They had a lawyer making a presentation. So this is great information, and I know the regulators in New York are upping their game with regard to this area. Have any of the prudential regulators promulgated any regulations yet? Well, you know, this is kind of tough to answer to some degree, but the short answer is no. However, and I always have to <laughs> preface that by, however, uh, back in 2021, the OCC issued a document called uh, Principles for Climate-Related Financial Risk Management for Large Banks. And, and of course, quote, large banks being the critical word there, but the agency announced general principles and discussed management of those risk areas. And And so under those general principles, the agency explained that governance and policies, procedures, strategic planning, risk management are all uh, obviously uh, very critical. Within risk management, the OCC actually delved into the identification, measurement, monitoring, and control of climate-related risk. So you can see they're they're setting the table uh, for financial institutions as to what the level of expectation will be. Uh, and while, like I said, while there are no uh, regulatory changes yet, anytime you, you start seeing you know, these guidance documents and these general principles that come out, I would suggest to people, let's be proactive. Let's not wait for things to happen. Don't wait to have your, you know, your physical risks assessed or to think that you know, this major climate event needs to occur in order for us to pay attention to it. It's coming. And I guess it's as simple as that, Len. It's coming. Yeah. And and by the way, our focus today is on the prudential bank regulators. But I believe last week, we're speaking right now, and we're recording the session on April 3rd of 2024. But the the SEC did come out with some uh, climate risk regulations. So publicly held institutions are going to have to be much aware of that. Now, I understand the big hurdle that I believe regulators have not yet figured out is how to address the availability of relevant, accurate, and timely data. So in your opinion, how should institutions quantify climate risk consistent with the guidance that's been issued so far? 
Well, I can always count on you to ask the great questions. So I know you're you're well aware of the answer, I'm sure, but thank you for prompting me to expand upon that. As you know, your company, Geo Data Vision and M M&M, have been working for several years uh, on a solution uh, for this. And while we do not have what we call a plug and play software solution as of today, we do have the data, the mapping, the knowledge to exceed and I and I and I have to say exceed the regulatory expectations. So, you know, I encourage financial institutions to contact us so that we can help facilitate an assessment of their actual physical risk. And, you know, perhaps Len, you might want to expand on the data and mapping that that you have worked so diligently on and and it, and it just gives that that image. It's just it's really just a, to me, it's cutting edge stuff. And so why don't you expand on that a little bit, Lynn? Sure, I'd be happy to, Dean. I was prompted to look into this matter because we're getting an increasing number of inquiries here at Geodata Vision about do we do anything regarding climate risk assessments. Back a few years ago, I got enough inquiries. I said, I better take this seriously and take a look at things. And sure enough, my concern was finding something that was pragmatic, practical, and measurable. And after doing a lot of research, we have discovered data that is practical, pragmatic, and and measurable. And there's an enormous amount of data uh, on the different natural climate hazards. And this, it's been developed by a myriad of resources, which includes FEMA and a number of federal agencies, as well as major universities. The data covers natural phenomena such as hurricanes, flooding, tsunamis, as well as droughts and ice storms. Moreover, there is data that identifies community vulnerability and resiliency. And the icing on the cake is that the data can be retrieved at the census tract level, which makes it compatible with the Community Reinvestment Act regulations and fair lending enforcement. Yeah, well, without letting the cat out of the bag, can you expand a little on how the model actually works? Sure. The very first thing that must be done is to geocode all records to be analyzed. This allows for the correlation of a financial institution's records with a geographic unit that is retained in the Federal Climate Risk Database. Once that's done, it's simply a matter of correlating the financial institution's records with the risk associated with each geographic unit. The exciting thing about this is the analysis of the resulting data and risk characteristics can be done on the most granular level down to each individual record and the risk gradients can be compiled at the macro level so the bank also can assess their overall risk exposure stratified for a loan portfolio, for example. A financial institution is able to determine what percentage of its loans are exposed to which climate hazard and the level of that risk spread from no risk to very high risk across the entire portfolio. And there's another exciting aspect of this breakthrough. We can create dynamic online interactive maps depicting the location of natural hazards and the level of risk associated in that geographic area. Maps are a great tool for recognizing the location of risk and where the most serious risks are present. And maps help people understand the geographic dispersion of climate risk exposure. Len, thank you so much for sharing that. And I know that you've worked very, very hard and and you know, I've seen this in action and it is to me cutting edge stuff. And I know the regulators have shown some tremendous interest in what we're doing as well relative to those mapping software. Yeah, correct, Dean. And and I would encourage financial institutions to be proactive and not wait for the regulator to inquire on what steps an institution is taking to assess and mitigate climate risk. It would be much better if banks lead the way in the development of a pragmatic, climate risk rating system, rather than rate for the regulators to develop what may be an overly set of complicated regulations. The recent new CRA is a good example of how convoluted things can get when the regulators are leading the way. So, Dean, do you have any parting comments or guidance on what, if any, steps a financial institution should take now? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I know you always ask me towards the end, so I always have to prepare myself in advance uh, <laughs> Uh, for those parting words, but you know, climate risk obviously is has has many impacts, and you know, I, I always have to tell people, you know, I'm not talking about climate change; I'm talking about climate risk. And we all hear about the increased frequency and severity 
of these natural disasters, rising sea levels and, of course, greater uh, temperature volatility. As we sit here today, I mean, I'm in central Maine, Len, and, and we're talking about another two feet of snow. Mm. And, and here we are in April, which is crazy. But these types of climate risks obviously could and may impact financial systems by changing value and assets, uh, cost or availability of liquidity or credit, and, and access to, of course, risk mitigation instruments and operational losses. So, you know, I think a proactive approach is certainly something that we would encourage. They should begin identifying those climate risks as we speak. There are various levels of risk, obviously, within a financial institution. Uh, and these risk factors should be combined into, you know, their overall uh, risk assessment. Uh, they, they go through a compliance risk assessment each year. I would think climate risk would be a component of that because it, it, it does measure potential threats present at the financial institution. And as far as, you know, wh what I've seen, at least in my opinion up to this point, I would start with what we call the physical assets, such as loans and deposits and facilities not to mention the criti critical vendor facilities such as data center uh, locations or record retention sites with loan notes or other documents that require some sort of a wet signature and then kind of work your way out from there. I would also seek out mapping solutions you know, that, that, that GeoData Vision provides. They include risk maps that portray those climate hazards and the relative risk areas uh, within their, their overall assessment area or market area. That will help show the various types of climate-related risks and the impact on asset locations if a climate event were to occur. Once again, you know, the various climate events that we see all the time carry varying levels of risk, and I think that's impactful and should be not only the risk identified, but also mitigated appropriately so through a risk assessment. Also, community vulnerability and resilience. How, how, you know, how is the community itself in responding to these types of major events, can they identify areas that are more prone to climate events and, and, and then look at the community itself to say, can they respond from something like that? Risks arising from climate change have essentially two basic channels that we've seen, and at least all of the guidance that's come out at this point talks about those two channels, which are physical risk and transition risk. And, you know, today I've talked a lot about the physical risk. And you know, I think that's where I would start and I would continue to encourage people to start. That's the, you know, the potential for losses in climate related changes that disrupt various business operations. They destroy your capital. They interrupt the economic activity. And, and, and uh, it certainly refers to the, the financial impact of a changing climate, including more frequent weather events and gradual changes in the climate, as well as other you know, environmental degradation, such as air, water, land pollution, water stress, and so on and so forth. But then you get into, you know, transition risk, and that channel really deals more with policy and a shift towards a low-carbon economy. And, and, you know, that to me is going to impact industry. So as an example, abrupt adoption of climate and environmental policies and technical progress changes would change market sediment and other types of, of things within within the the financial world that uh, ultimately could impact or enhance the risk with a particular industry. If I'm if I'm lending as an institution to the car, the automobile industry, if I'm floor planning something, you know, those can have significant impacts given the new uh, policy of our government with a net zero carbon footprint. So you know, we well, we also, we obviously, you know, need to consider both channels. But I think the physical risks can have a much more significant impact on the safety and soundness of the financial institution. So I would consider this a cr critical first step for any institution. And as I said before, with the transition risks, uh, we believe that these will be more long-term impacts on the financial institution resulting from those big policies that could impact operations as well as customer habits. So, you know, those are the two channels. Again, my recommendations focus solely uh, or, or at least initially on the physical risk. And I think transition risk is more of a longer term type of an assessment. Yeah, I, I agree with your suggested approach, Dean. I think it's a practical 
and pragmatic approach that is what banks need to use initially anyways. And for any of our listeners that are interested in getting additional information about our climate risk services and solutions, we encourage you to visit our podcast website, compliance911show.com, or alternatively visit uh, the mnm.consulting website, and that's m and m uh, consulting or the geodatavision.com website, G E O D A T A V I S I O N dot com. Len, I'm glad you mentioned our services and thank you for putting the uh, uh, website or contact information in there. Of course, we're plastered all over social media. Uh, you and I, I, I know. So by all means, please reach out to us and we'd love to help you. As I said earlier, the risk assessment to me is a critical first step before an institution integrates into an overall enterprise risk management framework. So I encourage institutions to take proactive steps to address this emerging issue. And and I hope that they, they found today's uh, podcast informative. And we certainly welcome comments and any ideas for future topics. This is Dean Stockford from m M&M Consulting. And this is Len Suzio from GeoDataVision saying, thank you for listening to today's podcast. And again, we invite you to let us know what topics you would like us to cover in future podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Compliance 911 Show. If you like the podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. While you're at it, please give us a like and review to help others find the show. As always, links are in the show notes, and you can always find us online at compliance911show.com. Follow m M&M Consulting and Geodata Vision on LinkedIn for all the latest news and information on compliance hot topics.